Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for today. We thank you for the way that you have blessed us in so many ways. Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have now to, to give back to you as just a way of saying thank you for what you've done for us. Thank you for a church that, that gives. And Father, because we give, we're allowed to do all these different ministries uh, that we've, we've seen this morning with the children's ministry and stuff. And Father, uh, our, our people... We just thank you for them. So, Father, I pray you might bless these tithes and offerings. For, Father, I also pray for our missionary this week, Chris Risden, in Japan there. Lord, I pray that you might bless him as he plants churches there. Lord, he's just going through some back surgery also, so he's recovering from that. So, Father, I just pray that you would touch his body and heal him also uh, with the back surgery there. So, Father, I just pray now that you would bless our time together today as we worship you together. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I want to also take this opportunity to remind you of our 50th uh, anniversary celebration. Uh, we're excited to look back and see all that God has done at Grace Baptist Church. So we want you to mark your calendars for October 10th through the 12th uh, as we gather to celebrate our first 50 years uh, together in ministry. Today, I'd like to share with you a brief overview of the history of our children's and youth ministry here at Grace Baptist Church. From day one, Grace Baptist Church has loved kids. That was evident in the love that Jack Dean so eagerly displayed. Due to his passion for children and youth, the bus ministry was started. Kids all over Bowie were picked up to come and attend services. Stories are told of the competition between Pastor Price and Pastor Lane, who, who, who could pack the most kids into a bus on a Sunday morning and get those kids in, into Sunday school. Uh, so that was a, a neat thing to see. And then also in, in a small house, church where they first started, the first children's choir was started uh, by way of Willie Pitts and Gwen Beckham, uh, which helped form the foundation of children's ministry. The Iwana program was started in 1969 under the leadership of George Roby. Through the Iwana ministry, thousands of kids have been impacted with the gospel and have had the opportunity to memorize God's word. Throughout the years, we've had 13 Iwana commanders who have served in this amazing ministry. Through the years, many lay people stepped in and led a growing children's ministry through Sunday school, VBS programs, summer camps, and children's church. They served, a great, served as great opportunities for our children to grow spiritually. As our numbers increased, so did our need for a full-time children's pastor. We've had Eric Myers, Dave Vance, Aaron Holloway, and now our own Jamie Miller who have answered that call to children's ministry. Of course, a strong, a strong children's ministry leads to the need for a youth program. Jack and Maxine Dean saw that need, and they became the first leaders of the youth. Jackie and Toby Bird soon began working with the youth ministry. They led the youth in musicals, they had socials, and they taught Sunday schools. These musicals were even taken on the road, all right? They brought such strong community among, among the teens. Some of these teens are still very active in serving today. When Tim Albritton came to Grace, he continued the vision for music and drama. Tim started youth choirs uh, for all ages and continued doing musicals and dramas as well as summer camps. Uh, as you see there, a camp that we went to uh, out to Arkansas. And he also opened his house regularly to the young people. As the church continued to grow and the youth programs grew, Tim went full-time with the music ministry. And in 1986, Grace Baptist Church asked me to take over the youth program. The youth continue to, to do musicals, dramas, camps, and retreats, and retreats. Due to the growth among the youth, we, we then split and created a middle school ministry and a high school ministry. Sports outreach became a big part as it was introduced along with youth missions trips. Grace has supported youth missions trips that have centered pretty much on Saltillo, Mexico, 
Mexico City and the surrounding areas, and Houston, Texas. And you see those individuals that we work with uh, when we go to those different locations. Uh, one of our mission trips combined sports and drama, and we went to locations in Georgia and Florida, and what a, a great opportunity that was. But as a result of, of one of the camps we went to in Florida, we caught the, the vision for starting our own summer team outreach. These thus began teen extravaganza. Each year has looked a little different, but each with the goal of sharing the gospel and seeing teens come to Christ and grow in him. There was a time when due to space limitations in our building here, we rented some rooms at the Whitehall Elementary School across the way here and ran our middle school and high school programs uh, during the week there. When the two-story addition that we presently have uh, was finished, we then moved those ministries back here to Grace. Because of the importance of middle school ministry, God allowed us then to call middle school pastor uh, Jimmy Pederick uh, into our lives. And others have led the middle school ministry, our Joey Ryder and Chuck Scarlatta, along with countless number of volunteers. As the children's and youth ministry, ministries continue to grow, we began to, to pray for a place to meet the growing needs of our youth ministry. So God abundantly provided and gave us Jaira Place in 2008. Jaira has given us the opportunity to not only expand youth ministry, but has also, <clears throat> sorry, that's been just an awesome thing for me to have Jaira Place, if you don't know that, okay? Uh, <clears throat> now, I, I've read through this about 20 times, and I, I only cried once during it, okay? But this is one of those rare times, so... <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, but um, it's not only expanded our youth ministry, but also other ministries within our church. And so that's been a huge blessing. Uh, and we've seen students come to know Christ as a result uh, of that God's answer and, and provision of Jaira Place. We love the opportunity to take mission tips abroad. But for the past three years now, we've had the awesome privilege and opportunity to serve our community here through Grace Gives. Pastor Mark brought this vision to us. And we're so thankful because now we not only continue to take mission trips abroad, but we also value being able to do missions work right here in Bowie. As we look at our past, we see that God has supplied abundantly everything that we have needed in children's and youth ministry. Many of you have served or currently are serving in children's and youth ministry. And to that, I say thank you. And let's continue to serve God faithfully. May we be faithful to reach and teach our children and youth in the next 50 years. Thank you.
Amen. Psalm 117 says, Praise the Lord, all nations. Extol him, all peoples. For great is his steadfast love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Last week we had a hit, um, the choir special was a song called Never Once, and we're introducing that as the theme for the 50th. And the words uh, apply to what God has done, and we're singing and declaring his faithfulness. Here's some of the words that we're gonna, that we're gonna sing. Because um, in the 50 years, of course, these words are applicable. It says, scars and struggles on the way. We've had struggles and scars, obviously. But with joy, our hearts can say, yes, our hearts can say, Never once did we ever walk alone. Never once did you leave us on our own because God, you are faithful. And those are the words of this song. So it's really simple. I hope you can pick up on it. And uh, would you please stand as we sing this great chorus.
are faithful. God, may those words of the songs that we've sung just become real to us. May they become true in our lives, that you are faithful, and that in this life, Lord, there is no guilt, and we have no fear of death because you have conquered the grave. And by your power, we live, Lord. We just praise you. May those words, those true words of the gospel and the power of Christ just uh, be real in our lives, Lord, and we, we praise you for those. Uh, Lord, just uh, be with this service. May we may we hear your word and may it change our lives. I ask all these things in your name. Amen. This life has overwhelmed me And I feel like giving up I will cling to all you promised It will always be enough When the world around me It's hard to understand I will run to you my shelter I am safe within your hands You are my help forever I will not fear God you are with
I hope you've been listening this morning because God has been speaking through every song, through everything that has been said. I don't know about you, but God has been speaking to me. Never once did we ever walk alone. Is that not true? Can we, the people of God, not say that and shout that and sing that and cry as we say it because we know that it is true? We know that we know that we know that it is true. We might be going through a difficult season right now, or we might be celebrating, but we know this is true. Never once did you leave us on our own. God, you are faithful. God, you are faithful. Pastor Bill said something implicitly. I don't know if you caught it. He said, God has blessed our children's and youth ministries for our first 50 years. That got me. (laughs) You realize everything we do and say and focus on and prioritize right now will impact whether this church will be around in 50 more years. Do you realize that the little things we might disagree on or have to debate or discuss to come to agreement on have nothing to do with what will happen in 50 years? What will matter is if this church still stands upon the rock of Jesus Christ and says that I don't care if all around me is sinking, we stand on a rock that cannot be moved, and we will declare this day and every day forth that Jesus saves to the utmost Jesus saves. Okay, now to the real sermon. Sorry, I got up here. We missed the video. Just scratch it. Um, I love you, church. You have won our affections. We've been talking this month about a, on a series called Everyday Jesus, and we've been looking at everyday struggles that Jesus addresses in his most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus looks around as great crowds have gathered around him, and he looks out at the crowds, and his heart breaks for them, and he knows that, that there are issues that are plaguing them. And so he addresses very specific issues that touch their lives. Lust, anger, unforgiveness, greed, judging others, These were everyday struggles 2,000 years ago. And as we read, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to realize, wow, these are still everyday struggles that you and I deal with all the time. We've not graduated from these struggles. And the point of the Sermon on the Mount is not just to give us some principles from Jesus to to live a better life. As Pastor Brady said uh, the last two weeks, the point is to show us that every one of us is in desperate need of someone to rescue us from these struggles. And Jesus says, I am he. I am that person that you need. I say be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect, and I know you can't do that. That's why I'm going to the cross to declare you perfect, to give you a righteousness that is not your own by faith, through grace, so that you can live out what I'm teaching right now. The only way to find freedom from these everyday struggles is to trust in an everyday Savior, Jesus. Today we're focusing on the problem of worry. People worried a lot back then. And people worry a lot now. Anxiety is one of the top issues plaguing our society, our culture. It seems like people are worried more now today than they ever were. It's a serious, in fact, there's a physiological uh, 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 thing at work as well where, where there's often medication that is needed. Now, here's the problem. 
we have a spectrum of people here today. Some of you are on this side of the spectrum, and you never worry. You never worry at all. Like you, whatever goes, goes. Say la vie, right? You just kind of go with the flow. Uh, you live a carefree lifestyle. Some of you have family members who wish you worried about something, right? I wish he cared about his grades so he would do better in school. I, I, I wish he cared about getting a job because she needs to pay her bills. I, I wish you worried about something. Now that's a, a problematic life uh, perspective to have. We're not supposed to be carefree. Jesus calls us to be careful and caring and responsible people. But on the opposite side of the spectrum, you have people who worry about everything. I mean, everything. You are good at worrying. In fact, if worrying was a spiritual gift, you would claim that as your own. You know how to worry, right? Some of you are so good at worrying, you tell other people, I'll worry for you. You don't even have to worry. I got that for you. <laughs> but most of us are somewhere in the middle. We don't consider ourselves maybe chronic worriers, but with everything going on in our families, in our communities, in our culture, in our economy, you know, the top thing uh, Gallup polled it just last year, the top thing people worry about is our economy still uh, and we just have all these things to worry about. And let me just say, I, I'm not a, in, in general, I'm not a worrier. I tend to be kind of more on the carefree side. And, but there, is some, there are several things that I struggle to resist anxiety and worry. Let me um, just be honest with you and share the hardest thing that I have had to struggle with in my life and continues to be a struggle. And it started ever since I was a child is, and this might be hard to believe, is I have a terrible fear of speaking in front of people. <laughs> yes, I'm not joking. Um, well, it, when I was a child, my, I, I just, it was, it, it, it was a deathly fear. I would rather crawl under a hole and never be seen again than have to get up in front of my class and do show and tell or tell how, what happens to a plant, you know, I don't know, whatever the thing was. I don't even remember them. I, I erased them from my mind. But it just was, is it deathly, it, it was debilitating. I never wanted to speak in front of, uh, of people and I remember as a boy, I trusted Christ as a, at a young age, and I said, Jesus, I am sold out for you. I want to be a doctor. I'll, I'll be a medical missionary. I'll go to any country, any village. I'll live wherever you want in poverty, whatever it takes to reach people for the gospel. I'll do anything except <laughs> speak in front of people. God obviously has a sense of humor. It was the thing that almost um, prevented me from going into ministry. It was through many tears and weeping that I wrestled with why God would call me to do something I could not do. And yet it has been one of the greatest acts of God's grace in my life to call me to preach because every time I speak, I know that I have to turn to him, and I have to trust in him, and I have to trust that he will empower me to do what he's called me to do, and I have to give up that anxiety, that worry. So let me ask you for a moment, real quick, if you're writing down notes or taking, writing whatever down, let me ask you, write down right now, what do you worry about? Real quick, I know it doesn't take a lot of thought, you know what you worry about. What do you worry about? What do you tend to struggle with Money, your children, their safety, your marriage, your job, your boss, your home, getting married, getting remarried, retirement, your health, your aging parents. Here's what I know. Whatever that thing is, we don't have to worry about it. God's promise in his word is that we can find freedom from worry. I believe that this morning because I believe God's word and I believe the words of Jesus. Turn to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew 6, 24. Matthew 25 is where he starts talking about anxiety, but but the interesting twist here is that when Jesus decided to talk and preach on worry and anxiety, guess what topic he said was directly correlated? 
money, stuff, wealth. So I'm going to start in verse 24 after saying, don't lay up treasures uh, on earth, but lay up treasures in heaven. He says, verse 24, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. He says, you will have a choice in life. There are two paths. You, you can de be devoted and committed, and which he says, which you're actually serving money, or you can be devoted and committed and serve God. But you can't do both. We try to do both. But Jesus said, you can't do it. One has your affections. One will grab your affections, and you will serve that thing. That word there for money, and, and King James still uses it, it's the word mammon. That's just the, the actual Greek word transliterated into English. It doesn't mean much to us today, but to them it meant money, or more broadly, wealth, or you could even say stuff. And Jesus says to the people who are gathered around him to listen to him teach, you can't serve God and stuff. One will ultimately get your devotion. There's a tension vying for our affections, for our devotion, for our commitment, for our loyalty, you could say. And so Jesus says, you and I need to decide what we are devoted to. Because whatever you are devoted to is what you will seek after and what you will serve. And so are we most devoted to God or you could just say any earthly thing, whatever that thing is. That's, not, that's how he frames this whole discussion on worry. One scholar put it this way. Anxiety is a barometer of one's God. Or anxiety is a measurement of your God. Those with anxiety about life worship mammon or money. While those without anxiety worship the providing God. Now look how Jesus makes the connection now to worry. Verse 25. Therefore, that's the connection now. All right, listen, as I read, I'm trying to show you how you can read Scripture on your own. When you see therefore, you realize Jesus is connecting something to what he just said. So now this is intricately connected to the conversation on what you're devoted to. And he says, therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. What you will eat or what you will drink nor about your body, what you put on or what you wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Jesus doesn't beat around the bush here. He says straight up, don't worry about your life. That word for worry or anxiety or anxious can be defined this way. A restless endeavor to secure one's needs. A restless endeavor to secure one's needs. That I'm going to be, I'm going to fret, I'm going to think over, I'm going to mull over, I'm going to spend time uh, just, being, uh, just being consumed by this endeavor of trying to secure my needs. Whatever that need is, whatever I think my need is, children, marriage, better children, a better job, more money, uh, better employees, a better boss, whatever that thing is, I'm going to do whatever I can to endeavor to secure it on my own. It's the Martha syndrome. Mary and Martha, remember them? Jesus goes to their home, and they're welcoming into their home. They're hosting him and his disciples. And what does Martha do? She's the busybody. She's, she's doing what she should be doing, right, to host someone. She's making all the food, getting all the preparations, back and forth, doing everything. And she's frustrated and angry. And she looks at Jesus and says, tell my sister to do something. She's not doing anything, Jesus. And what does Jesus say to her? Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. But your sister, she has chosen the better thing, and that will not be taken away from her. You see, when we are so consumed 
with worry to endeavor to secure whatever we think we need or whatever we want or whatever we actually need. Back in Jesus' day, he, he, he mentions, look, food and drink and clothes. People in this day, many of them live day to day, hand to mouth. They worried about food because if there was a famine or a flood, done. Food is gone. They worried about clothes because they had maybe one pair of clothes because they were very expensive, maybe one extra. If those clothes wore out or ripped or whatever happens, what do I do? It's shameful now. I can't go out until I have a new pair of clothes. Those things were serious and they worried about them. Those are audience-specific issues that Jesus addresses. Because if I were to say here today, listen, church, don't worry about food and drink and your clothes, you would say, great, this is a great news, Mark. Thank you. I got that done. Because who here worries about food? We don't worry about food. We, we, Pastor Brady about lust. We lust after food, right? We love our food. It's not a matter of whether I'm going to eat. It's a matter of how much I'm going to eat of what I'm going to eat, Right? You're thinking about but when 11.45 gets around and, and, and Brady, Pastor Brady, because I never do this, Pastor Brady's a little long-winded. You're thinking of... <laughs> Just kidding. We both are. I'll take full responsibility, actually. Brady never is long-winded. Right? You're thinking, food. And you're not thinking, man, what am I going to do? You're thinking, man, where am I going to go? What's, gonna, what's not going to have a line... We don't, we, don't, we don't stress over that. We don't stress over clothes. Most of us don't. I got a whole closet full of clothes, sadly. And, and I still buy new clothes. And David Beth tries to get on me. Stop buying clothes. And she says, there's no room. If you buy more clothes, you got to take something out in order to put something in. <laughs> wow. Okay. Moving right along. <laughs> I think I was just rebuked by my church. <laughs> we don't worry about those things. We don't worry about those things. If Jesus were here today talking to us, he'd probably say, don't be anxious about your life. Don't worry about your 401k or your retirement. Don't worry about your house not selling or you needing or wanting a bigger house. Don't worry about getting married or remarried. Don't worry about whether your child will get into that nice school. Don't worry about what they're going to learn at that school. Don't worry. Why? Is not life more important than those things? Think about that for a moment. Is not life more important than having a nest egg for retirement? Not that that's unimportant. Please hear me. I'm going to get that in a moment. But he's saying, listen, at fundamentally your life does not consist, is not defined by whether you have a good retirement account. It is not defined by your health. It's important, but it's just not defined by your health. Your life is much bigger than what you are right here, right now. This life is like that, but we will live for eternity. Is not life more important than a new home or a, or a new job or finding a mate? Jesus is not saying these are unimportant, far from it. Later he'll say, your father knows that you need them. He knows what we need. But he's saying these things don't define our lives. Our lives are much bigger than any one of these things. But we tend to define our lives by them. That's the problem. That's the heart that Jesus get, is getting at here. If we will define our lives by the things of this world, we will worry about the things of this world. You may be thinking, Jesus, that sounds fine and good. But that's easier, easier said than done. I mean, we've been conditioned to be defined by what we have and what we achieve. Literally, I was reading a, a magazine this week about neuroscience. I, I'm not that nerdy, trust me. It was a Christian magazine. But it said, and, and it talked about how our, our brains are being rewired every day based on what we do. Pastor Brady talked about this two weeks ago. 
Literally, when we worry, we are conditioning our brains and creating synapses firing and, and neural pathways so that we are habituated into worrying. We are physically being rewired to worry or to lust or to be angry or to not forgive. And Jesus is calling us to rewire our brains because that can happen. We're going to get to that in September, Romans 12. Again, we've talked about it for the last couple of weeks. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Paul knew what we now have just discovered, that our brains can actually be rewired. Not just physically, but also spiritually in our hearts. And so Jesus doesn't just give the command, don't worry. He now uses a very profound illustration to convince us why we don't have to worry. Look what he says. Verse 26. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Look at the birds, Jesus says. And we're like, what, what? You told us not to worry, and you're now going to give us convincing evidence why we don't have to worry, and you tell us to look at birds? Really, Jesus? i got to build my retirement. I'm 10 years from retiring. You want me to look at birds? I don't have time for birds. I need to find a job. Look at birds. I need to find a mate. Look at birds. I have an aging parent. Look at birds. I have a prodigal child. Really? Look at birds? And Jesus says, yeah. Stop what you're doing. I know you think it's the most important thing in the world, but let me, can I offer you a different way since what you're doing is not working? Right? I think Jesus is saying, listen, are you worried? And everybody says, yeah. Okay, can, can we try a different way? Okay, Jesus, look at the birds. <laughs> it's an American goldfinch. It's beautiful, isn't it? When I first saw one of those, I thought, I was like, this is amazing. I didn't know these birds existed. I'm biased now. Maurice Harden, one of our missionaries, has gotten me into bird watching, so I tend to look at the birds now. That's a pretty bird, indigo bunting. It's found right in your backyard, everywhere around here, especially come April. Beautiful song. Look at the birds. Look at their beautiful colors. Look at their amazing ability to make nests. Listen to their melodious calls. And Jesus says, they don't sow or reap. They don't store away in barns. They don't have savings accounts. They don't have 401ks. And yet your Father in heaven feeds them. Do you see his point? They don't have to get an education. And yet your Father, not their Father, your Father takes care of them. And here's his point. He says it. Are you not much more valuable than they? Do you believe that God cares for you more than the birds? Now, I love birds. God takes care of the birds. I want to go on record. I love animals, okay? But God did not create, uh, did not create us in the image of birds, we as humans bear the image of God. You know, we are the pinnacle of his creation. Uh, we are the ones whom God has passionately pursued by sending his own son, uh, not as a bird, but as a man, so that he could restore our relationship to him. Do you believe that God cares for you more than the birds? Notice believe. Now Jesus is starting to tell us this isn't an issue of just doing something differently. This is not behavior modification. This isn't do this and don't do this. Jesus is saying it's a hard issue. It's about what you believe fundamentally about your God. Do you understand that you mean so much more to your heavenly Father than birds? 1 Peter 5, 7 says, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. That's our fighter verse this week. Short and simple, but powerful and effective. Because he cares for you. 
You have to believe that. You have to be convinced if you're going to break the bondage of worry. So is Jesus saying we don't have to work hard? Is Jesus saying, hey, everything we need will just fall into our laps. Let, let's just dr eat, drink, and be merry. God will take care of it. Let's just hang out and live with our parents' house forever. God's good. <laughs> no. Sorry. You, you can live with your parents for a time, but you probably got to get out <laughs> soon. No, Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 3.10, very simply, the, the command he kind of laid out, the principle, he says, if anyone's not willing to work, let him not eat. All right? In other words, we got to work every day. We got to work hard. That's what Jesus is saying. That's what Jesus is saying. How do I know that? How do, am I just making that up? No, because what does he use as his example? A bird. Do birds get up and say, whoo, everything's just going to fall on my lap today. Do, 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 do. Sing, 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 sing. <laughs> no. You know what they do? They get up at the, at, way before you and I do. So early sometimes that I want to curse those birds because they wake me up at 3 and 4 in the morning. They're up early. And from that moment to the moment they rest, which I have no idea when that is, but it's late in the evening, I assume, they are searching for food. They're pecking away. They're looking for worms. They're building nests. Nests are remarkable. They use these tiny little twigs and create something so powerful and hardy. It's like, wow, we can't even do that, that you're like engineers. And they're doing that. And they're driving away intruders. And they're feeding their young and protecting their young and on and on and on and on and on. Birds are straight up hard workers. But they don't worry. They work hard, but they don't worry. So if you need a job or a better job, search for one. Work hard to get one. And then when you have it, work hard at your job. And if you need a better job, work hard at getting a better job. If you're struggling with finances, you should stick to a budget. We should save for retirement. We shouldn't spend all that we have. That's biblical. If you want to be married, look for a godly man or a woman. Get involved. You got to actually talk to other women. You gotta, if you're a man, talk to women. If you're a woman, talk to other guys. Take them out on the date. Is that striking a chord? <laughs> to avoid worry, here's the point Jesus is saying. You do all that you can do and then trust God to do what only he can do. That's what he's saying. And at this point, Jesus is looking around, and his audience might have been thinking, well, he makes a good point. But Jesus, it's so hard to worry, not to worry. And Jesus says, okay, 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 okay. You get all hyper-focused on whatever that thing is you want or need. Go ahead, whatever that circumstance is in your life, go ahead and worry about it. Go ahead and be consumed by it. Let it distract you during the day and keep you up at night because that's what worry does to us. Go ahead and let it raise your blood pressure. Go ahead and get on medicine. Go ahead and do all that stuff. But answer me this one question, Jesus says. Who of you, by worrying or by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? Just answer me that. This is very unspiritual. It's just straight up logic, basics. Jesus says, can you make your life stretch a little longer by worrying? Can your worry, ask yourself honestly, can your worry at this moment have any impact on the uncertainty of the, the next moment? And if not, then why worry? Jesus continues, 28. And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Jesus is saying, okay, now you've looked at the birds. Now look at the flowers. And we're like, really? Seriously, Jesus? This is the best you can do? Okay. There's a pretty little flower. But really look at it. Do you see the lines? Do you see the veins? Do you see the seedlings in the, in the middle there? Do you see that? This seed, this, this flower is packed with everything needed to create hundreds of more flowers. 
It's beautiful. There's colors in creation that we've still not been able to, rep, rep, been able to replicate. They're beautiful, aren't they? And Jesus says, look at the detail that your heavenly father put into each petal. How vibrant the colors are, how the shapes are. They're wonderful, aren't they? Everyone loves flowers. Overall, we, people just love flowers. In fact, one of the best gifts I can give my wife is a bouquet of flowers. She loves the way they look, the way they smell. She always appreciates flowers. Now, on our seven-year anniversary, I forgot to give her flowers here and announce that, uh, you know, seven-year anniversary um, de- or in honor of Mark and Abeth for flowers. But this has nothing to do with the anniversary, but I would like to give her some flowers. Oh, yeah. Now, I got a great deal. No, 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 never mind, never mind, never mind. (laughs) That takes away, that takes away. I'm sorry. But these are very pretty flowers. The roses, I think some of her favorite. Uh, I I honestly don't know how they're not supposed to smell. I don't know, but she likes them. I don't necessarily like them, but there you go. There's some flowers. Here's the, I love flowers um, for my wife. But the, uh, the odd thing is that whenever you buy flowers, and they're great looking, and they're going to sit on our table for a few days now, but I got to admit, after a few days, they die. And they stink. And we throw them out. And they're gone. And I got my new flowers. And I got to do this over and over and over again with joy. But still, Jesus says, look at all the work that goes into this. I have a crepe myrtle in my backyard, and it's beautiful. And I was looking forward to it blooming, and it came right at the beginning of August. They started to bloom bright pink. I was so excited. I went on vacation, for, and I came back, and it was gone. No more flowers. I missed it. The whole year, I missed it. Jesus says, if God takes care of the flowers by sending the rain and the sun, and yet they die so quickly, how much more will he provide for what you need without worrying? Then he gets to the heart of the problem, and this is where it starts to hurt. But if God so clothes the grass of the field which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Whoa. Faith? You're questioning my faith? You're calling out that I have unbelief? You mean my worrying about my children doing well in school? Uh, My worry about my health? My worry about taking care of my aging parents? My worry about whatever that is? That's a faith issue? And Jesus says, yep. Exactly. Worry is essentially a faith issue. Why? Because it's a devotion issue. It's what you are devoted to. In a minute, he's going to say it's what you seek after. And we pursue what we believe is most pleasing. The reason why we are so devoted to the things of this world and worry about them is because we don't trust our Heavenly Father. Let's just be honest. The reason why I I try to endeavor to provide for my own needs is because I don't trust that God is actually God and can do that for me. When we when we worry, we decide to take our to seek security in our lives apart from the Father. And Jesus says that's a faith issue, that's a sin issue, and I'm calling you out on it. Romans eight thirteen it was mentioned a few weeks ago. If For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. John Owen said it best. Either be killing sin or sin will be killing you. 
We ought to make outright war against our sin, whether it's lust or anger or unforgiveness or whatever it is, or worry or, or being judgmental, whatever the sin is, we must be killing sin or it will be killing us. And the root of worry, according to Jesus, the, see, don't just try to dig up the, oh, okay, I'm not going to think about that thing. No. Get to the root of the issue, dig out that plant by the root, and the root is unbelief. When we give in to worry, that shows we are battling unbelief, that we are battling a, a dark force that has the ability to destroy us. We got to battle. Jesus continues. Verse 31. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles or the pagans seek after all these things. And then this phrase, if you write in your Bible, I would underline this or highlight it, circle it. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. Jesus says when we're worrying, we're acting like people, Gentiles, he's referring to people who don't believe in God, who are not trusting in their Father. And he says, they seek after those things. There's the word seek. That's, he's meant to draw us back to the idea of devotion. They are devoted to those things. Their greatest devotion is a job or a house or a portfolio or college or marriage or whatever, kids. And he's saying, as Christians, we have an amazing opportunity to stand out by living out this faith that we profess. We have a chance to go through the same struggles and the same issues that everybody else has, and yet not worry. We can be caring and responsible, and yet, and yet not be anxious about tomorrow. Why? Because we have a Heavenly Father that knows how to take good care of us. And because we've realized that our greatest devotion is not in those things, but in God, in Him. Now here's the kicker, verse 32. Sorry. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. You have to believe that your heavenly Father cares about us deeply. That he not only knows our needs, but he's going to say in just a minute in the next verse, that he is able to meet those needs. He is omnipotent, but he's omnibenevolent, all-powerful and yet all-loving. Those of you with, who are parents and you have a child, if, if you see a need, physical, emotional, spiritual, whatever it is, won't you meet that need the best of your ability? And Jesus is saying, that's, that's like our Father, except he, he knows all our needs and can meet all of our needs, and he's perfect at it. It should be comforting us to know that our Father knows our needs. He knows your job situation. I just want to say that. He knows your relationship situation. He knows about your loneliness he knows about your family strife and struggles and turmoil. He knows about your health struggles. He knows. He's not oblivious. He's not absent. We're not just deists. We are a theistic, believing people. We believe in a personal God who has revealed himself in this book and ultimately in his son. He knows what we're going through. They matter to him. If we truly believe that God knows, that would combat the unbelief of worry. Now verse 33. The whole time Jesus is telling us, don't worry, it doesn't add to your life. Don't worry, it's little faith. Don't worry, look to God. Now he says, here's what you ought to be doing. It's not this, it's that. There's a better way, he says. And the solution to worry is redirecting our devotion. The solution to worry is redirecting our devotion. Verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. 
Seek first. Meaning, you've been devoted to these other things, now redirect your devotion. Seek, that word seek means a search out with desperate desire. Like you're searching for a hidden treasure. An unceasing quest. Search for it. Search first. Seek first, he says. Meaning, this is your greatest priority, your greatest pursuit before anything else, before finding a job, before trying to get a mate, before having children, before having a 401k, before any of those things else. This trumps it. Seek first. Be devoted first to God's kingdom and God's righteousness. What does that mean? means God's agenda and God's plan trumps my agenda and my plan. It means to desire with the greatest priority the spread of Christ's reign on the earth. To see people around us submitting to King Jesus. When he says kingdom, that refers to a king. Jesus is king, and he wants all the people around us to realize Jesus is a great king. In fact, he's the king that laid down his life for his kingdom, and he now reigns on high, and we can worship him and love him and serve him and trust him because he is a very great and gracious king. That's our mission, to share that message with those around us so that they turn to Jesus as King and Savior and say, I want to be his follower too. I want to serve this Jesus too. And we make fully devoted followers of Christ. Jesus said back in the Lord's Prayer, verse 10, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. What he's saying is, Nick's the idea that it's my kingdom come, my will be done. And when we do that, something amazing happens. Our devotion gets redirected from our money and our marriage and our career and our children. Again, God knows the things that we need. They're not unimportant. But seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness. And he says, as long as your primary devotion is God's kingdom And God's righteousness, you won't worry. You won't worry. Why? Because the things that you're devoted to are what you will worry about. If you're devoted to all these things, you'll worry. But if you're devoted to God's kingdom, guess who's in charge of that kingdom? God, not us. I don't have to worry about a kingdom that doesn't belong to me. I can serve joyfully and heartily because ultimately he's in charge. You know, the general who's in charge of strategy and deciding should we go to battle here and there, there's a lot of pressure there, right? The guy who has one task and do it really well, he can can be committed to that while the general's in charge of figuring out what do we do and how do we do it. Well, God's the general. He's got it all figured out. And if we're committed to to obeying and serving and loving and trusting and, and being devoted to him, we won't worry because his kingdom and his righteousness have nothing to do with worrying. It has everything to do with joy and freedom and life and truth and grace and mercy and justice. And if we're seeking those things around us, we won't worry. That's what he's saying. He's essentially saying, you've been holding on like this to all these things. And Jesus is saying, now let go. Just let go. We've used this illustration many times. It sort of resembles, uh, reflects sort of the heart of our our leadership and and our, our perspective on things. Jesus is saying, let go. They don't belong to you anyway. And start getting your hands into whatever I'm involved in. And trust me that I'm going to place into your hands everything you need. Romans 8.32, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not along with him graciously give us all things? If God gave us the very best in his son, can we trust him to give us everything else that we need? I'll close with this. This promise is a blood-bought promise by Jesus for those who have decided to put their faith in him and follow him. If you're struggling with this, I first would ask you, have you decided to be a follower, a disciple of Jesus? Because if not, you can't claim this promise. 
God's heavenly, God is heavenly father and he calls all people to himself. But you have to admit, I've been living life apart from God. I've not been trusting God. I've not put my faith in God's sacrifice of his own son in giving me this righteousness that he's talking about. I've never done that. Maybe you've grown up in church, but you've never done that. Maybe it's your first time in church and you've never done that. And Jesus is inviting you to say, I can't do this on my own. I need a savior. You need to do that this morning. That's the call of Jesus. And to all of us, it's a call. It doesn't matter how long you've been walking with Christ. It's a call to surrender. Surrender. This is the posture of surrender. And Jesus says, your father knows what you need. And as you seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, all of these things that you need that will ultimately bring him glory, you will have. Do you believe this? Let's pray. Oh, Lord, we believe, and yet we pray, help our unbelief. I confess corporately that we, as a people, struggle with worry and doubting your goodness. Father, show us your glory in the grace of of the gospel of Jesus Christ. May the gospel overwhelm us with your goodness and your ability to come through for, for, for the area of our life where we needed most your provision so that as we look at the past grace, we can have trust and faith in your future grace. Make us a people who, who swim against the culture of worry Make us a people who are courageous to go out and be on mission and say, your kingdom come. This is about your purposes for Grace Baptist Church, for my family, for my life, for, for our children. That whether we have children or not, we want the next generation to grow up who don't struggle with anxiety as much as we do. We want them to see us bold and willing to reach our community with, with the gospel and say, Jesus, whatever else we need to do that, we trust you to provide it. God, this isn't just words. I'm praying, I'm begging for our church to stand out as a shining light in this community for your glory and for the gospel. We pray you would do it. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.